All right, everybody. Earthquake hazards. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the worst earthquake disaster ever and why was it the earthquake wor the worst earthquake disaster ever. We'll look at timing of earthquakes and how that matters, how buildings matter, how the geology underfoot matters, and then some of the damages done by earthquakes, or specifically the hazards. We'll also look at um, how we can map where more dangerous areas are than others. And then look at earthquake prediction and mitigation and some of the things we can do to kind of reduce the risk. So this is what we got going on today. First off, the worst earthquake disaster ever. This is the deadliest, 1556 Shanghai, China. It occurred about five in the morning, so most people were in their homes. It occurred over an area of 520 square miles in 97 provinces. And it was a 7.9 magnitude earthquake. Now they didn't have seismometers back then, but they did. We can mac match it up with the current Mercalli rating, which was an 11. Very, very damaging earthquake. It ended up killing 830,000 people, which is about 60% of the population of that region. Most of the deaths were because people were buried alive in their homes. Their homes were were hewn out of the hillsides in a very soft sediment called lust, which is kind of a silty clay. Uh, when the shaking began, things just started to crumble down. And before they knew it, uh, people were buried and unable to escape. Uh, a very terrible disaster. This part, this pairs up two very deadly things. Number one, buildings can be very deadly in an earthquake. And number two, the ground and how much ground shaking occurs. Can be very make things more or less deadly. Also, the timing you see, the timing uh, was uh, significant in this earthquake, being in, when people were in their homes, which were vulnerable buildings in soft sediment. So, first off, timing people at, at night are in their homes. This can be a good thing or a bad thing. In the case of the last disaster we just, just, just discussed, it was a bad thing, but. Um, in wood framed homes that we currently have nowadays, uh, those are a little bit more safe for, for earthquake activity. If you're in San Francisco or Los Angeles, you might want an earthquake to occur during the nighttime hours because you're safer than if you were in a building or on a freeway during an earthquake, which is an afternoon hazard. Uh, also, holidays, weekends, work days, there's examples of earthquakes that have occurred on holidays when people were outside of their homes and uh, Many, many lives were saved because of that. So timing matters. Buildings matter, specifically the structural stability of buildings. Um, again, there's a saying, earthquakes don't kill people, buildings kill people, because most deaths are caused by falling buildings or other structures. So we're gonna talk a little bit about buildings. First, an example. Two earthquakes that occurred about six months apart from one another provide good example of the building uh, safety. First one, San Francisco, California, 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake, also called the World Series earthquake because it occurred during one of the games, the World Series, um, was a magnitude 7.1 earthquake, but only had 62 deaths. And most of the deaths were from a collapsed freeway in Oakland. Uh, the Contrast is the Armenian earthquake of 1988, six months earlier. It was a 6.9, similar magnitude, but there were not earthquake-proof building codes enacted. And so there were 25,000 dead, uh, and uh, there was only 700,000 people in the area. So a significant amount of deaths from this earthquake versus the Loma Prieta. Only 25 uh, people were killed in, in the 1.5 million uh, around the central part of that epicenter. Some of the things that need to be considered when talking about buildings, the height of the building. Um, shaking is amplified if it comes in resonance with the natural sway of a building. And buildings all have kind of a natural sway. So that's a consideration. Flexible materials such as wood and steel fare better when dealing with uh, earthquake shaking in general where stiff materials have a tendency to crumble uh, because they're high frequency, they're like more likely to become in resonance with the earthquake 
uh, shaking. And of course, poor building codes, if there's not expectations to build good buildings, if the building quality is bad as well, uh, this can affect uh, whether or not you have a lot of deaths. There's cases of earthquake in um, Turkey in 1999 where uh, many of the deaths occurred because building codes were not in place and then people mixed in sand with the concrete uh, to save money and it ended up crumbling lots of buildings and toppling things down. Buildings can be reinforced to kind of retrofit them uh, to withstand earthquake shaking. Things like horizontal and vertical stabilizations can be added um, to where you have floors and roofs and trusses secured to shear walls, um, bracing and framing and buttressing te techniques to um, reinforce the actual structure. Uh, they even have these base isolators which are kind of like shock absorbers. You have a lead core with rubber and steel interlayers that kind of absorb the shock on buildings that are not necessarily designed up to code originally. So timing matter matters, buildings matter, and ground motion matters. Uh, the local geology of an area uh, uh, matters. More shaking occurs in soft sediment versus uh, less shaking in a harder sediment. And the idea behind that is that the seismic waves will kind of ring through a hard sediment like a bell, just kind of like uh, kind of zip through them. The, the waves can get good traction as they bound and bounce through the material. Whereas soft rock and softer sediment, even more, the waves slow down because they can't really get traction to rattle through the material. Instead, they kind of get bogged down and the shaking is amplified. Here's a visual of what I'm talking about where the seismic waves kind of ring through quickly in a hard sort of igneous rock like granite, for example. They sh the shaking is a little bit more in a softer rock like limestone or sandstone. And then when you get to alluvium, which is looser sediments, things like sand and gravel, uh, it bounces quite a bit more. And then in silt and mud, even more so. So um, there are numerous examples of areas that are spared versus destroyed because of their local geology. In the Loma Prieta earthquake that we discussed earlier, uh, much of the uh, shaking that occurred in the bedrock was minimal. This, if you look at the bay bri or the uh, bridge here, a structure that kind of like um, uh, was a, a double, a triple decker bridge here, uh, the Shaking that occurred in the sand and gravel areas of the bridge was actually much, much less than the, the mud areas, and the mud area is actually the one that collapsed. So you can see that it does definitely matter. You can actually put, pair all of these uh, earthquake hazards, things like timing, buildings, and geology, in numerous examples of earthquakes that have occurred throughout. We, we used the first example of the Shanghai earthquake in 1556. Uh, here's another example. Uh, February 9th, 1971, San Fernando Valley. This is in the Los Angeles area. At 6 a.m., a 6.6 .6 magnitude occurred. Um, and there were 67 deaths from this earthquake. When you look at things from the perspective of timing, it was in the early morning, so people were in their homes, typically wood framed, so that was an advantage. The geology was relatively uniform, so when you look at the damage pattern away from the epicenter, it's, it's, typically, it's pretty much uniform. It's kind of like almost a bullseye damage pattern. And then when you look at the buildings that collapsed, most of the buildings that collapsed were a combination of soft, soft first story buildings like the, the parking garage you see in the middle picture there or hollow core in the bottom picture you can see uh, there was crumbling and toppling in a hospital a VA hospital um, and there was some collapse of top heavy freeway bridges so uh, timing geology and buildings matter in any particular earthquake you can look at other examples of of dangerous things in an earthquake include liquefaction. Um, so these are the things that damage or kill in an earthquake, uh, starting here. Liquefaction is where sediment 
begins to shake. And if it's got water in it, the water will actually provide a uh, lubricant around the grains that cause the grains to slip and slide and move. And so uh, if you think about being on a beach and you've got the waves crashing on shore and you kind of move your feet a little bit, you sink into the sand. It's a little bit of a similar situation, only you have um, kind of this quick vibration of shaking that causes this to really amplify. Building sink and, and twist and turn and topple over due to liquefaction. Landslides are another consideration. Uh, landslides are triggered by the ground motion of an earthquake, and if the, you have a previously weak slope, it's going to fail. Over half of the quake deaths in, in Japan are due to landslides, believe it or not. And many landslides uh, in, during earthquakes have killed in the past. Aftershocks are another concern. Um, earthquakes don't really just have one main shock. There's usually some floor shocks, which are just light shaking uh, that occurs when the rock starts to crack and break along and move, move along the fault. So a little bit of elast that elastic energy is released. And then when the rock has the quick slip, that's when the main shock happens. And that releases, releases the most elastic energy. But then the rock kind of locks back up into place along the fault. And as it does, those are the quote unquote aftershocks. So they're usually smaller and numerous, but can be pretty significant. Um, many earthquakes can have a, a large main shock. And that, of say, maybe, for example, the 2011 Japan earthquake had a, a main shock of 9.0. But then there are several aftershocks that uh, range from 6 and 7 magnitude. So those are still pretty strong earthquakes. So if a main shock brings an area down, uh, and really damages a lot of things, the aftershocks can come through and kind of finish the job. Of course, the ground does fault and rupture, causing movement along the faults. Uplift uh, and, and subsidence can occur on, in terms of meters. Um, an example being the 1964 Alaskan earthquake had some areas uplifting 11 meters or more and subsiding some two meters. So that's a, that's a lot. A person is about a meter and a half. So uh, that's a lot of subsidence. Um, of course, uh, sometimes if you think about earthquakes Hollywood style, you might think of an earth, earth the earth kind of opening up and swallowing things. That definitely doesn't happen. Uh, in most cases, it's just ground buckling. Fire is also a big hazard and a concern. Uh, when fire happens, uh, in, during an earthquake, uh, it's pretty dangerous. Gas mains typically can break during an earthquake. Power lines are down, and that actually fuels, uh, provides a spark in the fuel for the fire. A fire can rage. Firefighters will go to, to put the fire out, and nothing comes out of the fire hoses because the water mains are broke from the earthquake if it's bad enough. So this is a real problem. 90% of the damage in the 1906 San Francisco earthquake was caused by fire. In the course, a very deadly event in 1923 in Tokyo, uh, it's uh, said that um, over 30,000 people died because of fires that raced through the surrounding areas around Tokyo. Of course, most tsunami are generated by underwater earthquakes. So we could put tsunami in the category of an earthquake hazard. Uh, when the seafloor shifts due to a subduction zone style earthquake, uh, the seafloor the, the sea floor can pop up in terms of, in, in distances of meters, uh, you know, two, three, four, five meters. And that actually causes the entire water column uh, to move upward and outward uh, from the great force of that. This is what happened in the tsunami of, in the Indian Ocean in 2004 that struck just off the coast of Indonesia. Uh, that tsunami was such an enormous uh, killer event that over 250,000 people were killed in that event. And of course, uh, flooding can occur if uh, a human-made dam is ruptured. Uh, there's been cases of this where uh, different dams have broke uh, during an earthquake causing uh, massive uh, flooding. 
1971 in San Fernando Valley, California, that earthquake we spoke of earlier, um, there was a large earthen dam and below it was like 80,000 homes. And the dam was about 30 feet above the, and do I have a slide on this? The, 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 um, the earthen dam was basically a big hill of dirt that hold, held this water in this reservoir. And shaking occurred so that only four feet of the 30 feet that were above the water line remained. If any more shaking occurred, it would have been a really big dam disaster. Here's a look at where uh, Earth's, uh, specifically in the US, earthquakes are a concern. A lot of fault line and activity of Earth moving occurs along the west coast of the US, specifically uh, along the San Andreas Fault there in central and northern and southern California there. Uh, but there's also movement uh, in the Washington, Oregon, northern California area due to a subduction zone there. Uh, you do have some area around Yellowstone National Park that's moving and shifting. And then the central part of the U.S. there, southern Illinois, southern Missouri, western Kentucky and Tennessee and northern Arkansas, there's an area there called the Real Foot Rift where uh, it's thought that um, a magma plume came up, melted the crust and caused it to weaken and drop and shift. And that actually caused a... Um, uh, situation where there's lots of faults there and shifting occurs frequently. Um, so there was a large earthquake in 1811 and then another in uh, 1812, Jan uh, December of 1811, another in January of 1812, uh, and then another in February of 1812, or big earthquakes, seven, seven magnitude earthquakes is thought uh, in that area. And then lots of earthquake, earthquake activity there in South Carolina. If you look at the earthquake uh, map worldwide, you can see uh, this earthquake map showing uh, the, the world. And most of the earthquakes are occurring along the plate boundaries. Okay, So you can see uh, along South American coastline here, uh, Mexico and Central America. Also along the Indonesian frontier and along the Philippines and Japan, these are where there are massive plate boundaries, specifically convergent plate boundaries and subduction zones. This is where the largest of earthquakes can take place. There's even some, sub, some subduction zone activity along the Caribbean Sea there. Uh, that, then there's continental collision all along where India is colliding with Asia. And you can even see in this map the, bu the buckling taking place along the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, this is uh, some of the most populated areas in the world. So that is a recipe for big disasters there. And even through uh, parts of the Middle East there. So as far as predicting earthquakes, um, short-term prediction is kind of difficult. There are events that occur right before an earthquake. They're called precursor events, things like foreshocks. Um, the ground can crack a little bit and uplift right before earthquakes occur. So uh, measurements are taken for those, uh, but not a lot of headway has been gained through short-term prediction. There are two methods of longer-term prediction and that's called paleo seismology and seismic gaps. So I'll briefly outline these. Paleo seismology really gives us a general uh, when an earthquake might occur. If an earthquake is certain, has a certain frequency, we can kind of like predict when it might happen again. And then seismic gaps are generally where an earthquake would occur, um, you know, uh, if an area along a fault has had sh several amount of sh lots of shifting in kind of specific areas, but not much shifting in one area, we know that that area is probably not. So here's a paleo seismology example. If you look at this theoretical fault going through this um, area here, you note that um, it's maybe a filled in river valley. Uh, the fault going through has shifted a lot in the lower layers, a little bit in the middle layers, and not at all in the upper layers. What that means is that the lower layers are deposited, then you have a fault come through and move, and then the middle layers are deposited after that, and then the fault moves again, 
causing the lower layers to shift more and those middle layers to shift a little. And then you have layers uh, deposited on top of those that haven't shifted yet. Because this, these layers have peat in them, you can actually get um, a radiocarbon date of when they were laid down and possibly when the shifting occurred. And so if you know the, um, the uh, dates, uh, you know the relative uh, times when the shifting had taken place. In this case, about 100, every 135 years. So because uh, the layers are due for shifting, we know that this earthquake is likely to, uh, an earthquake is likely to happen in this location. This is the kind of general idea behind paleo seismology, the general when an earthquake will occur. Seismic gaps, on the other hand, if you take this theoretical fault line with zones A through F, you note that uh, the circles indicate where earthquakes have occurred in the past, noting that much shifting has been taking place between A, B, and C, also between E and F, but not a lot during D. Where do you think the earthquake is going, the next Earth's shifting is going to take place? Where is their pressure build? Well, of course, in zone D. So seismic gap is also a way that we can use some common sense in order to determine when the next future earthquake will occur. To give you a real world example, uh, this is the Acapulco Trench, which is where the Cocos Plate is subducting underneath the North American Plate here near the coast of Mexico. And all along this area, we've had shifting um, that has taken place. In 1985, a large set of earthquakes occurred all along the area that was known as the Neochoacan Gap. And this area shifted, causing uh, the earth to, um, this seismic gap to fill in. And of course, that earthquake was pretty significant, even though a little pretty, pretty far away from Mexico City, it did have significant damage occur in Mexico City. Um, still existing is that Guerrero Gap. So when you hear about an earthquake in Mexico City, uh, in the future, you'll note that is probably because the Guerrero Gap is filling in uh, and shifting. And of course, the uh, Loma Prieta earthquake we talked about earlier filled in in 1989, still existing along that area that stretches from San Francisco to Parkfield there, uh, are the Parkfield Gaps and the San Francisco Peninsula Gap. So uh, we expect Earth the earth to shift there um, in the next big earthquake near and around San Francisco. One more example here, Istanbul, Turkey has seen regular shifting of the North Anatolian Fault all along the fault line. And as you look at it, you see that there was a gap near Izmit, Turkey, and that's exactly where an earthquake occurred in uh, 1999, um, August, and then another in November. Istanbul is along that fault line, and there's a huge amount of population, um, a lot of soft sediment because it's near the Black Sea, and the buildings are not built in a way that's very strong. So uh, we can expect to see a pretty damaging and possibly very deadly earthquake there in the future. Uh, the Tokyo earthquake I mentioned earlier from fire, uh, it broke and shifted in 1923, but there are still many areas along the air, uh, Japan there that are ga seismic gaps. One of them, of course, shifting and moving in 2011 to cause that massive tsunami. So what can we do to protect ourselves? Just be prepared. Um, as a citizen of an earthquake prone area, you need to kind of be ready for um, being able to survive on your own for a few days if an earthquake does occur. Things like water supply, flashlights, um, blankets, and things of the sort uh, to be able to uh, survive on your own, some, some emergency food supply. But if you just kind of know that earthquakes occur in your area and you're ready, uh, you can help uh, prevent earthquake death of your, own, your, of your own and also help those in need when an earthquake does occur. Um, Many people are prepared for this, of course, where they live in earthquake prone areas, but it's good consideration for all of us. So that is a look at earthquake hazards, including um, build, uh, timing of earthquake, buildings uh, involved with earthquakes and the geology of earthquakes. Then we went through and talked about the actual things that damage and kill during an earthquake, including liquefaction, landslides, aftershocks, uh, ground rupture, fire, and water, including tsunami and flooding. We looked at 
mapping of hazards and predicting earthquakes through precursor events in the short term, paleo seismology and seismic gaps in the long term, and how we can be ready to prevent uh, earthquakes in the future. So that is a look at earthquake hazards.